Hello, thank you for joining us. We will be starting in about um, 90 seconds. Welcome and thank you for joining us. We will be starting in about uh, a little less than 60 seconds. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, we will be getting started now. So welcome. Um, you are uh, at the first <coughs> of the project briefings for the CNI Spring 2020 virtual meeting. I'm Cliff Lynch, the director of CNI, and I uh, wanted to just take a, a moment to uh, extend a welcome to everybody who's joining us today. Um, I hope that you will find this and the series of uh, project briefings that we have scheduled over the course of the next two months to be very uh, valuable and informative. And um, I will be introducing our speakers uh, in just a moment. Uh, I think most of you are probably familiar with uh, Zoom at this point. It seems to have taken over many of our lives. Um, I will just note on this one, we will be using the Q&A um, uh, button down at the bottom of your screen to take questions. Um, and you can ask questions at any point, but we will be, um, the, the presenters will be um, fielding all of the uh, questions um, in the, uh, in the, at the end of their session. So let me um, introduce our speakers. Uh, they are both from Ithaca SNR, uh, Christine Wolf Eisenberg and Jennifer Frederick. Um, they are gonna share with us the first public release, I believe, of the key findings from their 2019 library survey. And I'm really grateful for them, for them uh, coming to do this uh, at CNI. Um, we have a long tradition with this survey, uh, which has been taking place periodically for almost a decade now. Um, so it's actually a very valuable longitudinal uh, data set. And um, Ithaca has been kind enough to use us as the um, initial release venue um, for uh, many of these um, for many of these surveys. So that's all I have to say. Um, I will turn it over to Jennifer and Christine and um, Diane uh, uh, Goldenberg Hart from CNI will uh, pop up at the end and moderate the questions. Over to you, Jennifer and Christine. Wonderful. Um, thanks so much, Cliff, for, for that warm, warm introduction. And thanks, everyone, for, for being here today. Um, as Cliff mentioned, we are here to talk to you about the findings from our latest cycle of, of the library director survey, which we've been fielding at Ithaca SNR for the past, um, past decade or so. And we just released the report of findings resulting from this project on our website earlier this morning. So we'll make sure to circulate that link in the, in the chat in just a bit. So this is a, a project which really examines strategy and leadership issues from the perspective of academic library deans and directors at four-year institutions. And um, I want to want to start by generally acknowledging that a lot has has changed over the last few months, especially in the last last couple of weeks. Um, these these results may may function as a time capsule of sorts, given when when data collection occurred. And you'll hear from us a number of times about how results may have been different if we were to survey later. And, and of course, strategies and, and policies will only continue to change. So we are planning on conducting another library director survey this fall to, to address those specific changes. 
So I also want to want to kick this off by saying saying thank you for for being here today. I obviously wish that we were all together in in San Diego, and I know that everyone's lives more broadly look quite different than than expected. Um, so also want to say want to say thank you to CNI for for pulling together this virtual format for the meeting series um, and doing doing so so quickly. Um, so thank you, Cliff, Diane, Beth, all the others who are who are making this possible. Uh, so for those of you who, who don't already know us, uh, my name is Christine wolf -Eisenberg. I'm the Manager of Surveys and Research here at Ithaca SNR, and I'm joined by my colleague, Jennifer Frederick, who will be walking everyone through the key findings in just a couple of minutes. Um, we're keeping our cameras off for now, so you can give your, your undivided attention to, uh, to the findings, but um, our intention, if all goes according to plan, is to enable uh, video chatting for the Q&A portion at the end. So here at Ithaca SNR, I know many of you are, are familiar with our work, but our, our aim is really to help academic and cultural communities, particularly um, with the work that we do with, with libraries, publishers, and museums, help organizations uh, know what's coming next, learn from, from rigorous, well-designed research studies, and, and adapt to a variety of, of new realities and opportunities. So, some of the projects that you you might be familiar with aside from the one that we're here to to talk to you about today might be our large scale surveys of um, of faculty members or or community college students our collaborative qualitative studies of faculty in particular fields or perhaps our our advisory services in a variety of areas I want to take a take a moment to give a big thanks to to our um, our sponsors who make this project possible um, in this cycle. That was Elsevier, JSTOR, and Wiley. And I also want to thank our project advisors who have really contributed substantially to to the development of of thematic areas for this survey cycle around which we wrote survey questions, as well as contributing to um, to the interpretation of our subsequent analysis of findings. So with that, I'll just say a word or two about our agenda and then hand things over to, to Jen. So you've already heard a little bit of background information about the project. Um, Jen will then go through um, just a quick overview on methodology. Um, we'll spend the bulk of our time talking about the, the key findings that you will see uh, reflected in the report that again was just released today. Um, and then we should have about 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. Um, we will also be happy to stick around afterwards um, if anyone wants to chat with us one-on-one uh, -on -one about the findings, has any questions, we're also happy to answer follow-up questions via, um, via email uh, after, the, after the session is concluded. So with that, Jen, handing, handing this over to you. Great, thanks, Christine. Um, so many of you are already very familiar with this project as a participant, as a reader of our reports, and so on. Um, for those of you who are less familiar, the questionnaire includes topics such as how directors spend their time, the constraints they face, the strategies they use, how libraries increase information discovery, and how collections are developed. Um, this survey cycle, we added coverage on three key topics equity, diversity, and inclusion strategies, as well as the recruitment and hiring practices that directors use to achieve these strategies. Changes to collection strategies, including how um, directors are navigating the increased cost of journal packages, and the library's role in ensuring student success outcomes. We distributed the survey in October 2019 with invitations and reminders from members of our staff and our project advisor and recent ACRL president, Trevor Dawes. We closed the survey in December 2019. We had 662 total participants for an aggregated response rate of nearly 50%. Um, and we're so grateful for, for all of our participants in this project. Um, we definitely couldn't have done it without their engagement. Looking further into the response rates, um, as we've seen in previous cycles, our highest response rates were from directors at doctoral universities, and our lowest response rates were from directors at baccalaureate colleges. 
Um, while we did have different response rates across groups, we did not weigh responses based on what groups people were a part of. <clears throat> we also expanded our coverage of demographic variables in the current cycle, and looking at these variables, we see the, the vast majority of participants were white, most were women, 55 and older, and have been at their um, current institution for five years or less. So this gives you a general um, idea of who the average participant is in our sample. So now I'm gonna to turn to the key findings in the library survey 2019. And as Christine mentioned earlier, um, these findings are based on a, a snapshot in time based on responses coming in late last year before the, the current pandemic. And I'll discuss a few um, key findings that were, have likely been impacted as we go through them. Our first key finding is that library directors continue to perceive both their roles and the roles of the libraries as de declining in the eyes of their supervisors and other higher education leaders. So in this and all uh, um, of the following slides um, of the results, you'll see the, the question we asked in the survey on the left-hand side and a graph demonstrating the finding on the right-hand side. So we asked library directors to indicate their agreement with three statements about how they think their direct supervisor and other senior leadership perceive the library director role as well as the library's role. Um, we've been tracking perceptions of the director role since 2013 and perceptions of the library, the value of the library since the 2016 cycle. Um, and as you can see here, slightly more than half of directors strongly agree that they and their direct supervisor share the same vision for the library, and slightly less than half strongly agree that they are considered part of their institution's senior academic leadership. However, only about 20% strongly agree that their college or university's library budget demonstrates that it recognizes the value of the library. In each of these cases, there has been a steady decline with fewer directors strongly agreeing in each survey cycle. Um, and although it's not shown here, we found that these decreases are consistent across Carnegie classification. So while, while directors at um, doctoral universities have more strongly agreed with each of these statements compared to masters and baccalaureate institution library directors, all have seen decreases over time. Um, so next we look at the same items by Carnegie classification, um, focusing solely on the current 2019 cycle. In each case, more respondents at doctoral universities strongly agree compared to baccalaureate college and master's institution directors. Here the biggest differences are for the middle item in which about two thirds of doctoral university respondents strongly agree that they are considered part of their institution's leadership compared to about half of master's institution respondents and about 30% of baccalaureate college respondents. Um, so what, what you might take away from these findings is that while perceptions on all of these items are trending more negatively over time, there does appear to be relatively more alignment between library and other leadership at doctoral universities and master's institutions. Looking further into how library directors and their direct supervisors vision for the library is different, we asked respondents how important different library functions are to them and to their direct supervisor. In each case, respondents believe the library function is more important to them rather than their direct supervisor. The biggest gaps were for library supporting and um, facilitating faculty teaching activities, the library serving as a repository of resources, the library serving as a starting point for locating information for faculty research, and the library supporting graduate students in conducting research, managing data, and publishing scholarship. This gap has always existed, um, at least as long as we've been surveying library directors, but it, it has widened for many of these functions, where library directors are consistent in their own views of these ca um, capacities, but they believe that their supervisors have trended more negatively over time. The next key finding is that student success remains a top objective for library directors, and they see their library contributing most to increasing student learning and enhancing student well-being. 
We asked library directors to indicate their agreement with a series of statements about student success. Most of these items were first asked in the 2016 cycle, while we added an additional item on targeted support for underserved student groups this cycle. Across time, there are no major differences, but looking at the 2019 cycle, um, we see there are a few differences in how directors responded to these items based on Carnegie classification. The vast majority of directors from all institution types strongly agree that supporting student success is the most important priority for their library, and their library collaborates closely with other units on campus to improve student success. Shown here, directors at doctoral universities generally agree less strongly with the first statement and more strongly with the second compared to respondents at other institution types. And I also want to draw your attention um, to another major difference here. In the item second from the bottom, baccalaureate college respondents much more strongly agree that their library lacks the resources it needs to contribute to student success. <coughs> These findings suggest that library directors generally want to support student success, um, but they see the, the process of doing so as a collaborative effort with others on campus. And of course, in order to, to contribute, they need resources. Further, we asked how much of a priority different functions of the library are to directors. Um, these functions generally provide students with access to an informal learning environment, technology resources, and course and learning materials. Many of these items we ha um, have here have been included since our 2013 cycle. Um, we've also added more coverage on open education since then and an, an additional item about library space use. These items displayed here are all focused on student success and are part of a larger list of functions that includes research support, data management, and collections. Three items stand out as the highest priorities across Carnegie classification. Respondents most prioritize providing a physical space, both for independent student learning and for student collaboration, and providing reference instruction to undergraduate classes. They prioritize providing and helping faculty create open educational resources and services for online or hybrid classes less. Um, however, if we ask these items today rather than at the end of last year, we would likely see differences in these responses as libraries have, have moved, um, many have moved online along with colleges and universities in general. To summarize, at the, the time of the data collection, um, respondents most highly prioritize providing a physical space for students and reference instruction to undergraduates. Thus, it's clear that the current pandemic is likely largely impacting some of the most important major functions of academic libraries. Next, we asked directors the extent to which their library contributes to different student success outcomes, which are our new items in the current cycle. Displayed here are the aggregate results averaging across all participants. Two thirds of directors or more consider the library to contribute to increasing student learning and helping students develop a sense of community to a large extent. Meanwhile, about half believe the library largely contributes to more traditional student success outcomes, such as increasing student retention and graduation rates and less than 20% believe that the library greatly impacts increasing student enrollment. The only significant difference in responses by Carnegie classification was that a greater proportion of baccalaureate college respondents consider the library to greatly contribute to increasing student learning compared to doctoral university respondents. These findings suggest that, that libraries take a more holistic approach to student success in addition to, to caring about those more traditional outcomes. Our next key finding is that relatively few library directors agree that their library, as well as their broader institution, have well-developed strategies related to equity, diversity, inclusion, and access. We asked directors for the first time to indicate how well developed their strategies for equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility were. Here we see that about half of respondents feel that their library strategies are aligned with their institution strategies, but only about a third strongly agree that their library and institution have well developed strategies 
to improve equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility, both for its employees and in their collections. Respondents at doctoral universities, however, more strongly agree with most of these statements. These results indicate that library directors perceive these as areas that can be improved. Um, and this, is, this also prompted us to ask respondents about their practices related to selection, recruitment, and hiring, which library directors report being greatly involved in themselves. We also asked respondents about where they post um, job advertisements for the first time. We, we gathered the list of items to be included through desk research, utilizing the ALA's website section on equity, diversity, and inclusion, the Black Caucus of the ALA's website, and Reforma's website. Um, and we also received feedback on these items from advisors and during testing. Here we see that the most common places library jobs are posted according to directors are on library associate, association job boards or listservs and national higher education job boards or listservs. And they also send um, job advertisements to colleagues or library and information schools. Posting on library job boards or listservs for historically underserved populations is relatively less, less common, um, except in the case of doctoral universities. Um, and further, um, almost no respondents reported that their library posts flyers in neighborhoods where historically underserved populations reside. Again, there are differences here by Carnegie classification with doctoral university respondents indicating that they or someone involved in hiring do most of these practices more frequently, um, with the biggest the gaps uh, being for uh, posting on library job boards or listservs for historically underserved populations and posting directly on their library's website. Of course, where job advertisements are posted directly impacts who is likely to see and subsequently apply to these positions. Um, so we can see here that, that job advertisements are most often posted to general online job boards and listservs or sent to colleagues. Thus, those who have access to online resources and also who have the connections are likely to see um, more library job advertisements. Next, we added items a cycle about more general recruitment, hiring, and selection practices. Again, these practices were selected based on desk research, feedback from advisors, as well as um, issues that I engaged with while conducting research as a graduate student at the University of Michigan. Um, here we find that two practices stand out across Carnegie classification as common. <clears throat> The majority of directors share that they that those involved in hiring um, include separate minimum requirements and provide uh, preferred qualifications in job advertisements, and they also use a structured interview script with each applicant for a position. About two thirds of doctoral university respondents also indicated that their library requires parties involved in selection be formally trained on equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility and less than half of master's and baccalaureate institution respondents say that they required this. I also want to draw your attention to the item um, list the salary or salary range on the, the job advertisement, which is the fourth from the bottom. Um, we find that this is not a particularly common practice with the third or less um, saying that their library does this. We also looked at this item by public and private institution. And we find that even at pre, uh, public institutions where salaries are often posted online for anyone to find, only a bit more than a third list the salary or salary range on advertisements. At private institutions, less than 15% list salary or salary range. Again, these practices impact who is able to find and engage with um, job advertisements. And in cases such as asking um, applicants for their accessibility, accessibility needs, for example, um, can signal how equitable and inclusive a library is. So now we're going to move to the key findings that, that may be the most impacted by the current pandemic, um, either in a way that re reverses what we found or in a way that accelerates what we found. 
So our next key finding is that directors anticipate increased expenditures for services and staffing related to teaching and research support and decreases in collections expenditures are expected over the next five years. Um, so this is one area where we might see an acceleration of the finding today. We updated our items on resource expenditure the survey cycle, giving participants the opportunities to select if they anticipate expenditures will increase, remain the same, or decrease in the next five years. Overall, respondents most expect their expenditure in all areas to remain the same. Um, however, when we look at um, specifically at the expected increases by Carnegie classification, we do see some differences. First, in all cases, respondents most expect to increase expenditures for services, including services to support teaching and learning and services to support um, research. They expect fewer increases in collection spending, including rare, special, and other distinctive collections, as well as general collections. Instead, they anticipate actually decreasing expenditure in these areas. So doctoral university respondents especially expect to increase spending on services um, to support research and also expect to increase expenditure on rare, special, and other distinctive, uh, distinctive collections more so than other directors. These findings demonstrate that libraries value increasing services over collections, perhaps um, to further contribute both to student success outcomes and to supporting uh, research for faculty and students. Since 2013, we asked library directors if they anticipate adding or reducing employee positions or making no change in a variety of areas. Again, we find that respondents um, mostly expect to keep employee positions the same. Um, and in the graph here, we display the top 11 positions with the most expected increases and the remaining items will be displayed on the next slide. Um, the, the biggest anticipated increases are for instruction, instructional design, and information literacy services, student success, engagement, and outreach, and specialized faculty research support. And these top items are again related to service provisions rather than to collections. However, there are also differences in this by Carnegie classification, uh, most notably across the board, doctoral university respondents expect to add employee positions in almost all of these areas. In fact, for specialized um, faculty research support, we see that three times more doctoral university respondents expect to add positions compared to baccalaureate college respondents. Um, and if you remember from the previous slide, research services was an area that respondents at um, doctoral universities especially expected to increase expenditure. While we don't show overtime analyses here, we do find that um, generally there have been decreases in the proportion of respondents who expect to add positions. And of course, the ability to add positions is directly related to budget. And we have already seen that, that library directors believe that their budget allocations do not adequately demonstrate the value of the library. The remaining items are displayed here. Um, so in this in this bottom half of the list, we find some items that relate to collections, um, such as collections development and print preservation and collections management, further lending evidence that, um, at least at the time of data collection, um, library directors did not perceive this as an area that needs to be further developed. And again, um, we find that doctoral university respondents generally expect to see, um, to increase um, employee positions more than other respondents particularly for marketing, development and fundraising, human resources, and finance and business operations. We also don't see as many decreases over time in these items, um, as many of them started at, at low levels to begin with. The next key finding is that directors are less interested in increasing financial support for technology, systems, and infrastructure, with the biggest decreases coming from doctoral universities. Um, and again, just as a reminder, these results are from last fall, and we, if we asked participants the following questions now, it's likely that we would see major, major changes here. So 
since 2013, we've asked the respondents to select their top three areas where they would allocate money if they received a 10% increase in their budget. Given that a lack of financial resources is the biggest reported barrier to enacting change, these areas represent the, the greatest priorities directors would like to address if this um, barrier was somewhat relieved. Displayed here are the top 10 areas selected by the most respondents. Um, there's a lot going on here with, with respondents uh, most wanting to increase their budgets for new employee positions or redefine positions, um, suggesting that more would increase um, employee positions if they had the budget for it. We've also found um, that funds would be allocated to online or digital journal and databases and facilities expansions and renovations if um, respondents received a budget increase. I also want to draw your attention to one of the steady decreases over time, that for technology system and infrastructure, which is near the black arrow on the screen. Fewer directors have selected this as one of their top areas to use increases for in their budget since 2013. There were also a few differences across Carnegie classification. Doctoral university respondents were more likely to select new employees or redefined positions, um, similar to how they expected to, to increase these positions more, and publishing or scholarly communication initiatives. Master's respondents selected employee travel and professional development, and um, baccalaureate college respondents selected digital preservation more than others. These results suggest that um, there are a variety of key areas in which libraries would benefit from more funding for, um, but that in some, some areas such as technology, there was a, a decreased need for additional funding. But again, these results are likely different today as more and more libraries are working remotely. We also asked respondents about what their um, primary constraints are on their ability to make desired changes in the library since 2013. Um, and by far the most commonly selected across all, all survey cycles was lack of financial resources. All other constraints were chosen much less frequently. Um, there are a couple of, of decreases in the percentages of respondents who selected particular options, um, but the most pronounced trend was for challenges in implementing new technologies, which is again the, the item next to the black arrow. Not shown here, um, we also find that doctoral directors choose lack of financial resources and differences of opinion with other um, college or university leadership, less so than others, um, other respondents. And baccalaureate college respondents choose um, labor regulations less than other respondents. These findings continue to show that financial resources are most needed and that technology concerns, at least at the time of data collection, were seen um, as less constraining. Next, spending on electronic books now roughly equals that for print books. Since the first survey cycle in 2010, we've, um, we've asked respondents about the percentage of their library's materials budget is spent on different types of items. Since then, directors have spent the, the biggest proportion of their budget on online journals and databases, and they've spent much less on all other items, including print books, ebooks, and print journals. Over time, we find that they are spending a greater proportion on both types of online uh, resources and a smaller percentage on print resources. And if you look at the bottom red bars for um, print books and ebooks, we see for the first time there's an equal, about equal spending on print books and ebooks. We've also asked directors since the first survey cycle to predict their spending in five in five years. Um, since the 2016 cycle, we've been able to compare their predictions with actual spending. And as we've seen here, their um, predictions have been largely accurate. We've also in included respondents' um, predictions, predictions for um, 2024 here. And um, given the accuracy of their previous predictions, we can expect these to be fairly accurate as well. 
Um, so we can expect that library directors will continue to increase their percentage of spending on online journals and databases in comparison with other items. Across Carnegie classification, there are also a few differences in 2019 spending, but doctoral university respondents spending an even greater proportion on online journals and databases and even less on print journals compared to other directors, but baccalaureate respondents are spending more on print books compared to others. These findings may indicate that baccalaureate college libraries are still building their physical collections more so than are others. Our next key finding is that half of library directors are likely to cancel a major journal package in the next five years. This survey cycle, we added questions about journal licensing generally and specifically how likely directors think um, it is that they will cancel one or more major journal packages. Overall, about half believe they are very or extremely likely to cancel at least one major journal package. And looking at Carnegie classification, we see there's not much difference in the proportion of respondents who are likely to cancel a major journal um, subscription based on institution type. Additionally, we've asked respondents to indicate their agreement that the value of licensed e-resources is rising faster than cost since the 2016 cycle. Um, the percentage of respondents who strongly disagree has fallen almost 10 percentage points since 2016, with only 14% strongly agreeing in um, 2019. We also found um, few respondents strongly agree that when their journal licenses come up for renewal, it's a high priority um, to bundle open access publishing fees along with um, subscription costs with only 20% strongly agreeing. We asked all respondents, um, so both those who did and didn't expect to cancel journal packages, who they would want to discuss the possibility of canceling journal packages with. Um, the th three groups they consider most highly important to talk to are librarians, faculty, and senior academic leadership outside of the library. These first two groups are, are likely to um, be strongly impacted by cancellations as they either depend on access to such resources for their, for their research, or they will need to help constituents get access to resources. Further, respondents at doctoral universities generally consider it more important to talk to a wide variety of people before canceling journal packages. Our final key finding is that roughly half of library directors are interested in contributing to, contributing to um, institutional learning analytics tools, and about half are also concerned about third-party vendors having access to individual-level data. We asked respondents for the first time this cycle how much they agree that they are interested in their library contributing to learning analytics tools and that they are um, concerned about the extent to which third party vendors have access to individual level data from library users. And here we display the findings by Carnegie classification. About half agree with each of these statements, but in both cases, doctoral university respondents indicated the highest level of agreement. And not displayed here, we also asked how much library directors agree that presenting data on the contributions or impact of the library on college or university objectives is a compelling, compelling way to advocate for additional resources for the library. Although library directors reported more, more holistic views of student success as we saw earlier, um, compared to their, at least compared to their um, colleges and universities, about two-thirds of directors strongly agree with this statement, um, so they acknowledge that even if their objectives are more holistic, it is important to address the more traditional objectives and outcomes when um, advocating for resources. Taken together, these results suggest that library directors recognize the need for accurate data, and many are interested in providing that data, but there still remains some concerns about protecting the, the anonymity and confidentiality of communities at their institution. 
Finally, we added questions this cycle about what types of data most effectively demonstrate the contributions or impact of the library when shared with other um, senior academic leadership. Respondents were able to select up to three um, types of data and presented here is the aggregate data from 2019. About two thirds selected feedback from users. This was by far um, the most selected item here. The next most selected were um, utilization data, which includes store counts and download counts, and library contributions toward institutional outcomes, with about half selecting each. Um, compelling anecdotes, institutional or peer comparisons, and increases in efficiency and productivity were selected by even fewer respondents. From this, we gain insight into the data collection and analytics priorities of library directors, and we find that they prioritize the experience and perspectives of their users, and that when it comes to institutional outcomes, um, perhaps they are considering that the library is one part of a bigger picture. So with that, um, I'll open the floor up to questions. That was great. Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. And uh, hello, everyone. I just want to introduce myself. I'm Diane Goldenberg Hart from CNI. Um, welcome, everyone, to uh, this webinar. We're so glad that you could join us and um, be here for this really exciting kickoff to our project briefings for this meeting. Um, and with that, we are opening the floor for questions. Um, if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little Q&A box. Uh, and if you click on it, you should be able to input your questions into that box. Um, and we also have some questions coming in via chat. So I'll go ahead and start with those. Um, let's see. So one question is uh, from the last item, were respondents able to select multiple data points or were they limited? For, for this one? I believe so. Is that, is that what you're looking at? Yeah. Yes, okay. Yeah, they were allowed to select up to three items. <laughs> um, so they could select none, they could select one, two, or three. So once they got to three, they couldn't select any more. Okay, thank you. Um, Let's see, we have, we have several, uh, we have a, um, oh, here we go. All right, so Stephen, Stephen Bell is asking, um, is there any detail on what those resources are that are being considered for student success? Staff, collections, co-location with other academic support services, collaboration with faculty, et cetera. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, I'll I'll maybe jump in with a couple of points. So so I think it's it's um, some combination of all of the above, and what it looks like for a particular institution will obviously be different than what it looks like for for another institution. We do see that um, spaces and services are often identified as being being the most impactful. I would say um, collections tend to lag a little bit when it comes to supporting student learning. Um, obviously, you know, faculty research is a, is a whole, a whole different thing. Um, there was, there was one finding that I, I want to, want to mention here. We asked an, a number of questions, obviously, that are, are not presented here today. There was one item that we had library directors react to even about the value of, um, the value of library employees and connecting students with other kinds of resources on campus from other offices on campus. And we saw, you know, tremendous value um, indicated in that too. So I think it's, you know, some combination of all of the above, Stephen, to the to the different different options that you mentioned. And there are even some some things beyond that. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much, Christine. Um, all right, we have a question now from um, Lisa Hinchliffe, and she writes, understandably, this analysis so far focuses most on the current data collection. Have you had a chance to begin comparing uh, with past your surveys, your, with your past surveys, and have there been any noticeable, uh, notable differences? 
Yeah, Jen, do you want to do you want to speak a little bit methodologically to what kinds of comparisons are and are not permitted with the kind of overtime overtime findings that we look at? Yeah, um, so we because we um, keep the the data um, confidential for each survey cycle, we can't actually do um, statistical analyses over time um, because we can't connect the data um, from one year to the next by participants. Um, so we didn't actually run any statistical analyses over time. Um, so anything that we talked about over time was, was where we noticed there were um, some bigger differences, um, but just keep in mind that we don't know that uh, these are the same people responding every time. Um, in many cases, there are new directors at, at the same institution. Um, so yeah, we can't necessarily um, say that the same people are responding differently. Yeah. Um, but I mean, Lisa, to your, to your question about um, what's been, been the most notable um, increases or, or declines, um, probably pointing towards the the first the first finding around the value of um, the role of the library and the role of the library director has been um, meaningfully different over time. Same thing with um, investments in in technology. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, we've got some time for a few more questions. If anybody has any, please feel free to um, type them in the Q and A box. Um, we also have the opportunity with this tool to allow our attendees to engage directly with our presenters. Um, if you would like to um, ask a question live or make a comment, um, please go ahead and raise your virtual hand um, and uh, I can move you into um, speaking mode so that uh, you can engage directly with Christine and Jennifer about these issues. Um, so I look, I'm looking now, I see we have another question from Stephen Bell. Uh, okay, so Stephen asks, um, on your question about barriers to change, we see that staff resistance to change is less mentioned as a factor uh, by less than 20% of respondents. Given the level of library literature and discussion about the problem of staff resistant to change and the need for better change management, um, Perhaps we are overestimating just how much staff resistance is as a factor. Probably no exact answer on that, just an interesting observation based on the survey. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I know. I think that's I think that's a great observation. And just thinking towards so so I mentioned at the outset, and and maybe some some folks weren't on yet, so I'll just repeat it. Based on on what's going on in the world, going on in higher education, going on with with academic libraries specifically, we are planning on um, conducting another survey of library directors later this year, probably um, in the in the summer or the fall. One of the things that's really really um, you know notable about what's going on right now is that. Um, libraries are having to really reinvent their their offerings in a new way so so libraries have been relatively more well well positioned to pivot um, pivot services online given all of the work that's happened over the past number number of decades to do so um, but uh, you know some of the work that that Lisa Hinchliffe and I have been doing maps out um, what's going on with physical library buildings, what's going on with with services, what's going on with staffing, and and in particular to what extent are staff able to to work remotely. So this is a really interesting one where maybe we're not going to ask about it exactly in the same way later this year, but um, there's a lot of change that is is not going to be optional um, that is is taking place now is going to continue to take place later this year so um, you know appreciate you you drawing our attention to uh, to that item I think that's that's going to be a really important thing to keep an eye on that will be fascinating indeed really looking forward to to that sort I am jotting I am jotting it down right now <laughs> great um, all right looks like we've got a uh, uh, well, Stephen, first of all, says helpful to know this. Thanks for your response. But sure. we have another question um, in our chat from Rebecca Blakenston. Um, she says, I'm curious to hear more about the questions related to inclusive interview and hiring processes and where those came from. Are those items 
coming from a set of formal best practices that live somewhere, for example, screen reader checking of position descriptions, asking for pronouns, provider, providing salary information? Yeah, um, so these items, there wasn't like a list of items that we just took from, from somewhere. We compiled this list from, um, from desk research and um, I'm just bringing up my uh, slide notes so I can, um, so, so basically this, these come from um, some of the, the work is, some of this is from work that I've done previously with uh, at the University of Michigan. So I did my dissertation, for example, on um, disability. And so accessibility has been on my mind a lot. Um, and, you know, one thing that I had to, to do when I was um, doing that project was make sure that my, my survey was accessible to um, screen readers. So, so that's like, for example, where that item came from. Um, and we've also gotten um, feedback from, from advisors. Um, the University of Michigan also has um, a, a program called Advance, which um, I, I did work with. Um, so uh, they do trainings on things like requiring parties to, to be formally trained on, on equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility, for example. Um, so, so these came from a, a wide variety of places. There wasn't one, one single um, source that they came from. Excellent. Very, very interesting. Thank you for that answer. And thanks for that question. Um, all right. We definitely have a little more time here. If anybody has more questions, uh, just as a reminder, um, there is live tweeting going on about this project briefing and the whole meeting. Uh, our hashtag is hashtag CNI 20s, that is hashtag CNI 20s. Uh, we hope that you will continue to engage there and elsewhere about uh, this project briefing, our great plenary sessions, and we have many, many more uh, project briefings to come throughout the next two months. Yes, it's true. Two full months of project briefings from CNI. Um, we have also had a question about can the slides or the recording be shared internally? Yes, absolutely, please do. Uh, we really hope you will share all of our resources uh, that we make live and openly available on the CNI website, cni.org. Um, we also make the videos available freely, openly on our YouTube and Vimeo channels, and we hope you will uh, share this widely. Um, with your networks and with your staff and beyond. Um, and we are trying to get our, um, the videos of these out quickly. We're working on that right now. Um, and uh, yes, we, we understand that everyone is wor working at warp speed right now. Um, there's a lot to be done and we can all use a little support. So, um, we just want to thank you all for continuing to engage with us, uh, sharing your feedback with us about how this venue is working for you and what, what more we can do to help um, support you through this time. I uh, don't see any more questions. And again, I invite you to raise your hands if you would like to engage directly. Uh, Christine and Jennifer would be happy to speak with you. Uh, there I see, um, Christine has shared it. It's, it's in just chat. me. <laughs> yep. That's the link to the full report. So thanks for that. We'll put that on your project briefing page Great. as well, Christine. Great. So uh, you can visit cni.org, visit the, um, the meeting page, go to the project briefing page, and you'll find a link to the uh, slides, a link to the report. And when the video is ready, we will uh, we'll embed it on that page as well. Uh, so I'm hearing uh, some virtual applause coming through as Clifford commented at the plenaries. That's the downside of doing this virtually. We don't get to hear that lovely applause and a real time thank you from our audience. But we know how much they appreciate your time, your effort, uh, these fascinating findings. And thank you so much for sharing them um, at CNI and being part of our program. And um, with that, I will close out this webinar and I hope to see everyone back again for our for our next one.
Thanks everyone so much for, for coming today. Thanks Diane, um, Cliff for, for hosting us. If you do have any questions, feel free to, uh, you know, tweet at us, email us, uh, whatever variety of communication you, you prefer. We're always happy to, um, to, to help unpack the findings a little bit more, get you an underlying table of a graph, um, you know, however we can be, can be helpful in getting this information out there. Fabulous. Many thanks. Thanks Cliff. Thank you. Bye. Be well, everyone.